Hello and welcome to the International Daily Roundup by People's Dispatch, where we bring you major news developments from around the world. Our headlines, thousands of Amazon workers lead strike for fair working conditions in Italy. UN reports 15 deaths in massive fire at Rohingya refugee camp in Bangladesh. Houthis demand that Saudi Arabia lift blockades before discussing Yemen peace proposal. And in our video section, we take a look at armed rebel groups and the pretext of foreign military intervention in the Democratic Republic of Congo. In our first story, thousands of Amazon workers led a historic countrywide strike in Italy on March 22nd. The 24-hour strike was organized by three trade unions, the FILT-CGIL, the FIT-CISL, and Uli Transporti. Workers throughout the supply chain went on strike after the company refused to set another date to continue negotiations. Mobilizations were reported across the country, including in Tuscany, Florence, Emilia-Romagna, and Pisa. Local media reported that over 9,500 warehouse workers and 15,000 drivers participated in the strike. Workers have highlighted the precarious conditions of work. Of, out, out of the 40,000 workers, more than 10,000 are hired through employment agencies. Their administered contracts have a high turnover rate and usually last just three months. In other cases, workers are forced to leave after nine months. Drivers are working beyond contractually established working hours and often delivering anywhere between 180 to 220 packages per day. The CGIL union has also reported that workers are held responsible in case of uncertainties due to traffic accidents and other setbacks. They have demanded renewed negotiations with Amazon and presented a series of demands. These include meal vouchers, adequate travel allowance, health and safety training, and reducing the working hours of drivers. They have also asked for verification of the workload and work shifts in the supply chain and the correct professional classification of staff. Their demands also include a provision of a COVID allowance for operations undertaken during the pandemic. Monday strike action follows multiple such mobilization efforts by Amazon workers in the US, Spain, and Germany. In our next story, the UN has estimated that at least 15 people were killed in a widespread fire in a Rohingya refugee camp in Bangladesh. The UN Refugee Agency has also reported that at least 400 people are currently missing. The Bangladesh police have confirmed seven deaths so far. The fire spread across the Balukhali Rohingya camp in Cox Bazar on March 22nd. The World Food Programme has reported that camps 8E, AW, 9 and 10 were affected. The fire started around 4 p.m. and went on for about six hours. Refugees International has estimated that at least 50,000 people have been displaced as thousands of shanties were destroyed. As reported by the Dhaka Tribune, a senior officer from the Cox Bazar Fire Service has stated that thousands have also been injured. Two WFP nutrition centers and one food distribution center were also burned down. The largest health clinic set up by the International Organization for Migration has also been destroyed. Approximately 1 million Rohingya refugees reside in camps in Cox Bazar. An estimated 124,000 refugees reside in the four camps that are affected by the fire. Authorities are yet to confirm the official cause of the fire and a seven-member investigative committee has been set up. In the meantime, the World Food Programme has reported that refugees are now seeking shelter in nearby camps and UN transit sites. Emergency food, sanitation and medical provisions have also been deployed at the site. We now go to Yemen where the Houthis are demanding that, the Saudi, that Saudi Arabia lift its air and sea blockades if it's serious about a ceasefire in the region. Chief Negotiator Mohammed Abdul Salam made this statement in a response to a Saudi peace proposal on March 22nd. The proposal includes a UN-monitored nationwide ceasefire. It also calls for the opening of the Houthi-controlled Sana'a port and Hudaydah port in limited locations. Both ports have been only operational for humanitarian purposes because of the Saudi air and sea blockades. The proposal also calls for revenue sharing between the Houthis and the Saudi-backed government of Abdurrah Bansur Hadi. An estimated 100,000 to 230,000 people have died as a result of the war in Yemen and the accompanying Saudi-imposed blockades. The country is experiencing acute shortages of medical supplies and millions are at risk of starvation. Air raids by the Saudi-led military coalition have caused widespread destruction of the medical and civilian infrastructure. Iranian press TV reported on March 21st that several patients had also led a march outside the Sana'a airport demanding that it be opened. Saudi air blockades have prevented patients from traveling abroad for treatment. The Houthis have stated that the opening of Sana'a airport is a humanitarian right which must be separated from a political or military bargain. They have stated that the Saudis must lift the air and sea blockades before any peace talks take place. For our final story, we go to the Democratic Republic of Congo, where a rebel group has been designated as a, as a, by the US as a foreign terrorist organization. The Allied Democratic Forces Group has been blacklisted over its alleged links with ISIS. This is despite numerous reports by a UN group of experts denying any such link between the two organizations. Here is Kambale Musawali to examine the context of the rebel group's presence in the Congo. Now, to specifically speak about the ADF, the Allied Democratic Forces, those are Ugandan rebels who have been in the RC since the late 90s. They have some political claim. No? They believe that the rule of uh, Uganda is not what the Ugandan people believe, uh, believe or fought for. Uh, they are somehow connected to a religious group. 
uh, they say that they are Muslim uh, fighters and so on. And then since the late 90s, even with the invasions of Rwandan and Ugandan DRC, they have never been stopped. There is another rebel group similarly to that too, the FDLR rebel group. They are connected to uh, the Hutu extremists who participated in the Rwanda genocide. Uh, the reason why I'm mentioning that Rwanda and Uganda invaded and still did not stop them is whenever you are an occupying force in another country, because they, Rwanda and Uganda occupy the DRC, you, and you have the military power, especially when you are backed by the United States, and you still do not address the issue of this militia group, we know in the DRC that this is just a pretext to have military presence in the DRC that's continuous. The ADF for us is our weapons of mass destruction. Never been found. We do not know what they do. Yet, it's always a pretext for military presence. The United Nations um, Security Council mandated a group of experts since the early 2000s to provide reports on the situation in the Congo. Uh, they provide two yearly uh, reports in June and in December. And the UN group of experts have documented uh, the so-called ADF uh, crimes. In, in their documentation, they have said things such as, the ADF rebel groups in some areas speak Kenya Rwanda. Kenya Rwanda is a language spoken mainly in Rwanda. So these Muslim terrorists somehow speak a language that comes from Rwanda where Islam is a minority. And it's been documented. You have these ADF rebels who do that. But beyond what if, what's even in this uh, UN uh, group of experts report, even the people that we speak with on the ground, um, full disclosure, my family is from there. I've actually lost family members in their area. Whenever we speak to our contacts in these villages, they clearly tell us the attacks are known when they come, because the send a message say we are coming. It's usually close to Congolese army bases and UN forces who are in the DRC. When the killings take place, there is no military action from these armies. And after the killing, that's when you start seeing officials coming to try to find out what has unfolded. So people in the area are so angry at the UN. There was even a, a period a, a few years ago where the people of Beni um, and Butembo took stones and were throwing it at the UN peacekeeping forces because they were saying, why are you here? with the largest peacekeeping missions and you still can protect the population where your mandate is to protect the population. So the people in the area are very clear that these forces who are killing them constantly are not necessarily the ADF, but it's a ragtag of rebel groups who for whatever political reasons are not being stopped for over decades and are decimating the population. Beni and Butembo, uh, it's clear that the attacks, to me at least, and the people on the ground, is that the attacks are happening because of the land, uh, the resources on the land. It's a uh, huge arable land. Uh, it has oil uh, from, you know, there, there's been some studies that have shown that the oil Congo has over 2 billion barrels of oil in one of its lake. Uh, the lake is called Lake Albert at the border of Uganda and Rwanda. Uh, there is a, at least an estimated uh, 2.5 billion barrels of oil, and this oil extends from the border all the way to these towns. Um, and then um, going all the way through the park, the Virunga Park, which is a uh, UNESCO protected site. Um, and there's this question around, should we exploit oil or not? And the people have resisted. You know, we must protect the environment uh, rather than exploiting oil. But during a period, at least say half a decade in that area, massacre has taken place with no accountability. That's all your time for today. We'll be back tomorrow with more news from around the world. Until then, keep watching People's Dispatch.